Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Naeem, for an extraordinary presentation, except for the part where you think that I speak for all Jews. Um, my old rabbi would probably have something to say about that. Um, although, I must say, I'm, I'm now on the board of Jewish Voice for Peace, and our, thank you, uh, which is a great honor, and our rabbinical council, which has, I don't know, like 35 rabbis or something, um, they might be pleased that Naeem thinks I speak for all Jews. So. <laughs> you know, today is Yom Kippur, which I actually had forgotten. Um, but I can't think of a better place to spend it than here talking about human rights, Palestinian rights, and the need to work for justice. How better to atone for all of our various sins which, if you pay her enough, Liz will tell you. Um, you know, this is a year, a rather extraordinary year of anniversaries. This is the 100th year of the Balfour Declaration. How many of you have not heard of the Balfour Declaration? Few people. So the Balfour Declaration was a statement by the British Crown 100 years ago that called for the creation of a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. And it went on to say, as long as nothing is done to interfere with the rights of the indigenous population. That's the part you never hear about. Now, it didn't say a state. It didn't say a country. It said a homeland, a place where people could go. It was the, the early expression of the British monarchy and the British government uh, supporting what was then a fairly new movement called Zionism that was then about 20 years old that was a secular movement calling for a colonial project in Palestine, a, a project of settling European Jews in this other country. And the reason I use the word colonial, it's not just sort of my own assessment of what it meant on the ground, was because that was the word that was used by, is this thing very loud? Is this, it's okay? Okay. It sounds very loud up here. Um, the early Zionist writers used that language. In fact, my own sort of break with Zionism, I grew up a very active Zionist youth group leader and camp counselor and all of that. And when I finally broke with it, which was after some years of working around trying to end the war in Vietnam, I had been studying colonialism and studying imperialism, and I was also a good Jewish girl, so I went to my father's library to read Herzl, the founder of modern Zionism, whose work I had actually never read. And one of the things in Herzl's diaries, he includes the letters that he wrote to somebody named Cecil Rhodes, who was at the time the leading British colonialist uh, for whom Rhodesia was later named. And he wrote these kind of begging letters to Rhodes saying some version of, uh, I want you to support my project, this project to create a uh, Jewish state in Palestine. And he goes on to say, I know that your interest is Africa and mine is this little slice of Arabia. You're concerned with Englishmen, I'm concerned with Jews, so why am I asking you for this support? Because our projects are, quote, both something colonial. And I read that and I thought, whoa, nobody ever taught me that. It was a very interesting realization, and for me that was sort of the end of it, you know? So it is an important thing to recognize that the early Zionist writers were not operating out of what became known as religious Zionism. There's a, a thing in, in Jewish ritual where they talk about next year in Jerusalem. It's kind of part of the ritual. And Herzl and the other early Zionists were very clear, this isn't that. This isn't about that. That God will deal with that or he won't or whatever. Most of them didn't even believe in God. So they weren't interested in that. This was a political colonial project that in their view had nothing to do with religion. It was an ethnic national project. So we're now at 100 years of the Balfour Declaration. 70 years ago was the beginning of the Nakba, the, the word in Arabic that means the catastrophe, the word that Palestinians use to describe the dispossession that happened in the context of creating the State of Israel, where you had ultimately 750,000 Palestinians driven from their homes, some directly at gunpoint, others out of fear, others just told to leave in the process of creating the State of Israel. 
Those 750,000 refugees were later joined by another 250,000 driven out in 1967. And today there are over 5 million Palestinian refugees who are still stateless around the world, many of whom, many millions, live in refugee camps to this day. So that was 70 years ago. 50 years ago this year was the occupation of 1967 that led to what had been an Israel composed of 78% of historic Palestine, only 22% was left for the Palestinians between 1948 and 1967. And in the 1967 war, of course, that was the end of the 22%. Israel now occupied 100% of historic pal Palestine. 35 years ago was the Sabra Shatila massacre in the context of the Israeli invasion and occupation of southern Lebanon, where Israel lit the sky to make way for an Israeli-backed right-wing Christian militia that attacked the Palestinian camps of Sabra and Shatila, leaving, leaving thousands dead in their wake. 14 years ago was the killing of the young American peace activist in Gaza, Rachel Corey, who was killed by an Israeli soldier driving a US-built Caterpillar bulldozer, a D9 bulldozer made into a weapon of war. And nine years ago was the first of the series of Israeli wars against Gaza that we've seen over and over again in recent years. Cast Lead, Operation Cast Lead, was the first of what have now been three major wars in Gaza, killing thousands, destroying the infrastructure, leaving Gaza on the verge of being uninhabitable. The United Nations said several years ago that Gaza will be uninhabitable by 2020. That's three years from now. A new report issued last week said it might happen as early as next year. So this is a time of anniversaries. It's also in our country, we should not forget, a time of great horror for many people in our country. It is a time of rising racism, rising Islamophobia, attacks on women, attacks on LGBT communities, attacks on immigrants, attacks on refugees. It is a very, very difficult time to be anything other than a wealthy white man in this country. And around the world, the global war on terror is still being waged. It is still failing and will continue to fail as a method of dealing with the problem of terrorism. But this is part of US history. This is part of our US history in the region as a whole. So I wanted, I, I hadn't planned to do this, but when I was talking with Naeem earlier today, we realized that one of us should talk a little bit about history. We each sort of thought the other was. So since he seems to think that I am the, the uh, fact checker of the historians among us today, I'm gonna go through very quickly just a little bit of the history of what the US is doing in that part of the world and why and what we need to do to change it. So what we see in terms of Palestinian rights is the denial of rights in the context of something that is claimed to be about religion, but is actually not about religion at all. It's actually about land and about rights and equality and the denial of access to land and equality. So for the United States, the relationship with Israel, it goes back a long way. In the context of the creation of the State of Israel, the Nakba was 1947-48, even before that in the run-up to it, the US supported the creation of the State of Israel, supported Zionism, but it had the kind of relationship that a lot of other countries did as well. There was nothing special about it. There was nothing particularly significant about it. When the Israeli pre-state uh, Jewish militias who became the Israeli uh, National Army after the creation of the state when they were looking for weapons, they didn't go primarily to the United States. They got some weapons from the United States, but mainly they went to Czechoslovakia and other sources. The US was one of many countries to support the creation. It wasn't the main one. The so-called special relationship, the shift in that relationship, didn't happen until 1967 with the 67 war, the Six-Day War, 
which at the time, I was a young kid in junior high or high school, and I was one of the kids who was you know, running around at the Hollywood Bowl where all the movie stars were performing for Israel, and we had the, the buckets to collect the checks running up and down the steps of this theater. You know. But it was at that point that people first in the Pentagon, it wasn't first the White House or the, or the Congress, it was the Pentagon, looked at Israel and said, you know what, these guys are good. They, they won this war in just six days. Now, part of that was mythology. The mythology was Israel, plucky little Israel, defeated five massive Arab armies in just six days, and it was kind of David and Goliath. It was kind of magical. Now, what was true was the Israelis did defeat the Arab armies in just six days. What wasn't true was that there were five. First of all, there were only two that actually fought, but okay, whatever. It was a massive military victory. The Pentagon looked at that and said, wow, these guys are good. We could do business with these people. And business became the operative foundation of that relationship between the US and Israel and between the US and Israeli militaries. So they started immediately collaborating on building weapon systems together. Their weapons manufacturers started doing contract arrangements with US weapons manufacturers. So the intersection of military production, fighting together, all of that, became something that emerged out of the 67 war. Now remember, the context is the context of the Cold War. The US is looking at the Middle East, a very strategic region, lots of oil, important location, all of that, and saying, OK, we need allies here. The Soviet Union is making progress in that region. They're building ties with a lot of different countries. We've got to find partners. And who better than this country that has just shown itself to be a great military, have great military capacity. And you know what? They're kind of like us. The Israelis are just like us, which among other things meant they're white. The US had good, good ties with a number of Arab, station, uh, Arab governments, Arab countries, Arab states. But at the end of the day, they're still Arabs. You can't really trust them. The Israelis are like us. Again, another illusion. There was this illusion that all the Israelis were white, that all the Israelis were Jews who looked like me, whose you know, ancestors came from Eastern Europe. As it happened at the, by that time, the majority of, Israelis, of Israeli Jews were Arabs and Turks and Iranians. They were the Mizrahi or the Sephardi. They were not the European Jews. But they were not the ones who had been in power. Until 1977, their candidates never won the elections. So the ones who won the elections, it was the Labor Party. That was the powerful force. And they were the Jews who looked like me, or like my grandfather. Um, you know, that was, the, that was sort of the dynamic. But that meant that all the, all the uh, military leaders looked like that. All of the diplomats were white. So it was understandable that racist people in power in Washington sort of saw these guys and said, they're just like us. And they were racist too, as it turns out. So that was part of this whole sort of set of assumptions that created the relationship. The other thing had to do with the pro-Israel, pro-Zionist lobbies. Now those lobbies had been around for a long time. There had been lobbyists pushing the US government to support Zionism and support the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine since shortly after Zionism was created in 1898. The difference was they had never had much influence. They were there, they were pushing in Congress and pushing in the White House and whatever, but they didn't have that much influence because they were pushing against a lot of assumptions about what was in US national interests, strategic interests, economic interests, et cetera. Suddenly, after the 67 war, you had this new special relationship that I spoke about that was starting in the, in the Pentagon, and suddenly you had a match. You had a match between the political, the, the, the interests of the lobby, they were pushing for a political shift to support Israel, and the strategic. You have the military guys saying, we want this relationship. So suddenly, the pro-Israel lobbies are way powerful. It's, you know, if you imagine pushing a car, if the car is parked and you're pushing and pushing, nothing's going anywhere and you don't look very powerful. If the car starts to move, either somebody turns it on and drives or it's on a hill and you're pushing it from behind, you look way powerful, right? Because it looks like you're pushing this giant car. That's kind of what happened with the pro-Israel lobbies. They suddenly started to look really powerful 
because they were getting their way. They were winning. They had influence. And when you're a winning team in Washington, a lot of, a lot of people start to support you. So more people started paying them money. More Jewish uh, organizations across the United States started pouring money into these lobbies in ways they hadn't really before, because it suddenly looked like they were really influential. What's not to like? This was great, right? So suddenly you have this intersection of the political and the strategic shaping the special relationship. And that's what has remained to this day. Now at different periods of history, different ones of that component are going to be more influential than others. So during this Cold War period, you had both the strategic and the political interests combined. So they got really tangled up with each other. Very hard to sort of separate out. You suddenly have the end of the Cold War and suddenly Israel isn't such a strategic ally anymore. They're not so valuable strategically. But that political interest remains. So they still remain, the special relationship remains. That happens around 1990, 91. And then suddenly you have 2001 and you have the attacks on the World Trade Center Netanyahu's response when he's told about the attacks on the Twin Towers is, that's good. And then he catches himself and says, well, not good, but now they will know how it feels. So he immediately put it in the context of gaining more political support for Israel, which is exactly what happened. With the end of the post-Cold War period and the beginning of the global war on terror period, Israel, again, is both a political and a strategic ally again. So the, the relationship uh, remains. Now, I want to say just a couple of other things about this and then go back to some of the other questions about the, the policy issues. If we look at how the transition from that, of, from that special relationship being new and what we now take for granted in this country, it has a lot to do with education and a lot to do with the media. So if you look at schools across the United States now, it's not only Jewish kids who identify with Israel, who know more about Israel than almost any other country in the world, who follow developments in Israel. I remember when I was in high school, maybe ninth or 10th grade, I was in a, a um, international relations class. It was like a college prep class. And the first thing the teacher did on the first day of school was say, each of you is going to have to pick a country to become a real expert in. You're going to have to do a major report. That's what we're going to work on this whole semester. And like 30, 40 percent of the class immediately said, I want Israel. Now, not all those kids were Jewish. A few were. But everybody knew more about Israel than they knew about any other country. Why? Because it was in the press every day. We knew when they were having elections. You know, if you think about Cameroon, who knows who's the prime minister of Cameroon? When does Cameroon have elections? What are their exports? You know, all the things you have to do for a high school paper in international relations courses. Nobody knows any of that stuff. But Israel, we know all that. So there's that identification with it. And so that's part of the press thing. And then in the schools, there is an age-appropriate unit on the Holocaust in US schools, not every single school, but the vast majority of schools starting in kindergarten. They're brilliantly crafted, age appropriate, and frankly, in my view, it's a good thing. What's not a good thing is that it's only about the Holocaust. We don't hear about other Holocausts. We hear about the Holocausts, which if you put it in in Google, I mean in Word on your computer, it automatically capitalizes it. And I'm like, why is that being capitalized? It's a word. Is genocide capitalized? No. But there's been a claim that only the Holocaust of Jews during World War II counts as the Holocaust. The Holocaust of Roma people by the Nazis doesn't count. The Holocaust of gays and lesbians by the Nazis doesn't count. The Holocaust of genocide in Rwanda doesn't count. The Holocaust of Cambodia doesn't count. So this appropriation of even the language has spread through our educational system. And that, again, I think the answer is not that we should not have that Holocaust education. We just need to have education that is global and that understands what mass slaughter, what ethnic cleansing, what genocide means 
in every example in this country, starting with the genocide of the native population of this country. Because if we are serious about understanding genocide, that's where we have to start. That's where we have to start. For a country that is grounded on the wealth created by slavery and genocide, we got a lot of work to do in revamping how we do education. So that's kind of where we are on this. I'll come in a minute to sort of the more recent uh, components of all this. But let me put this in, in the moment for a bit of context. When I mentioned the global war on terror that is shaping it all, this is a quote from an incredibly brilliant US diplomat. And I don't often use those words in the same sentence. <laughs> but I do. Um, it's not because many, I, I shouldn't say that. I mean, I do sarcastically because it's funny. Always gets a good laugh. But it's not really true. There are some brilliant diplomats. The problem is most of them aren't allowed to use their brilliance until they're an ex-diplomat. In this case, this guy was brilliant while he was a diplomat and now is an ex-diplomat. This is a guy named Chaz Friedman, Freeman, who was once the ambassador to Saudi Arabia and was later the ambassador to China, also speaks fluent Mandarin and fluent Arabic and can translate in between them, which I find absolutely uh, astonishing. But here's what he said, this was about two years ago now, as the introduction to an article he was writing. The United States has now been engaged in a cold war with Iran for 37 years. It has conducted various levels of hot war in Iraq for 26 years. It has been in combat in Afghanistan for 15 years. Americans have bombed Somalia for 15 years, Libya for five, and Syria for one and a half years. One war has led to another. None has yielded any positive result, and none shows any signs of doing so. US drones have been killing Yemenis for 14 years, Pakistanis for 12, and Somalis for nine. Saudi Arabia's bloody effort to reinstall an ousted government in Yemen is almost a year old. In none of these wars is an end in sight. And I would add to Chaz's words that in none of these wars is the potential for peace anywhere at hand. It's in that context that today's relationship between the United States and Palestine-Israel takes shape. So while it has a history that goes back before any of the current wars, it exists today in the context of exactly those existing wars. And as Naeem has already said, conditions for Palestinians are getting worse and worse. You often hear the status quo is not acceptable. It can't last. The problem is, if you're an Israeli today, the status quo is quite fine. The status quo can absolutely last. That's not to say that Israelis don't suffer. There is occasional violence. We saw the killing of a soldier and, and two security guards at a settlement. There is a consequence that is paid for illegal settlement, colonialism, violations of international law. But in general, Israelis are doing fine. Israel is, as I mentioned earlier, depending on who you believe, either the 23rd or the 27th wealthiest country in the world. Israeli passports are welcomed everywhere. Israelis are traveling the world. Uh, and at home, not everyone likes it, but there is a relative level of stability. And for Jewish Israelis, they live in a vibrant democracy that is engaged, that has representation of a wide array of political parties. What's the problem? That could last a very long time. If you're a Palestinian, the status quo is indeed not sustainable. Palestinians are dying as a result of occupation. They're dying in Gaza, where the siege, occupation takes a different form in Gaza, because remember, occupation in international law does not mean the number of soldiers on the ground. You often hear, well, Israel isn't even occupying Gaza anymore. They pulled out of Gaza, and what did they got? They got rockets. That's kind of a, a, a litany that you hear. Well, the reality is Israel did not pull out of Gaza. It pulled out the settlements. There were five settlements, about 7,000 settlers. And they pulled the troops out and redeployed them instead of on the streets of Gaza, they now surround Gaza, as does a wall. We hear a lot about the West Bank wall. We don't always hear about the Gaza wall that completely surrounds every bit of the Israeli border with Gaza. The exit and entry to Gaza by 
people and goods is controlled by Israel. The airspace is controlled by Israel. The waters off the coast are controlled by Israel. The electric grid the, and the, what do they call it, the grid for, for um, cell phones and, and computers and the internet, all of that is controlled by Israel. Every bit of life and death in Gaza is controlled by Israel. It's in the form of a siege, not in the form of settler colonialism. That's a technical difference, but it is still occupation. In the West Bank, settlements are on the rise on a daily basis. Kids are being arrested. Israel is the only country in the world, the only country in the world that has what they call a juvenile military justice system. Meaning that kids from the age of 12 are picked up for throwing a stone or kicking a car or whatever, where a 12-year-old inside Israel, or a 12-year-old in this country, are brought to a juvenile court system whose goal is the well-being of the child. Where you can never interrogate a child outside the presence of her parents. Where you can never hold a child without a lawyer being appointed for representation of the child. In Israel, that's the same for Israeli kids. In the West Bank, for settler kids. It's in the interest of the child. For Palestinian kids, they are treated to the military juvenile justice system, which routinely carries out its arrests, not on the street in broad daylight, but at 2 o'clock in the morning to maximize the fear factor. They admit that, that that's the reason for it. The child is taken away from her parents. The parents are not allowed to be told where the child is being taken. They are taken to a prison inside Israel, itself a violation of international law, out of their own territory, interrogated at times in a language they don't speak, asked to sign a confession in a language they don't read or write. And these are children. So we are looking at the definition of, a part of apartheid. When you have two legal systems applying to two groups on the same territory when the groups are defined on the basis of race, ethnicity, nationality, religion, language, etc. That's the definition of apartheid. Ironically, Israel uses the word too. They just don't use the word in Afrikaans. You know, the word apartheid is an Afrikaans word for separation. When the Israelis talk about the wall that we call the apartheid wall and they get very outraged at that, they call it the hafrada wall, which means, hello, separation. So everybody's using the same word, they just use it in different languages so it has a different impact. The conditions are getting worse and worse, not better. The UN says that Gaza will be uninhabitable by 2020, now they say maybe by 2018, as I said. This is what is unsustainable. This is what has to change, and it's US policy that makes this all possible. So. What we have to be thinking about is how to bring pressure on the Israeli government. Globally, the most important pressure campaign is what is known as BDS. How many of you are familiar with BDS? Almost everybody, yay. So BDS, the Boycott Divestment Sanctions Movement, the creation of Palestinian civil society, not Palestinian diplomats, not the PLO, not the PA, not anybody in power. Civil society, women's groups, trade unions, youth organizations, sports clubs, everybody and their brother, 170 different Palestinian civil society groups came together to call on the world to engage in a campaign of bringing nonviolent economic pressure to bear on Israel to stop its violations of international law. It's not something that's supposed to go on forever because we hate Israelis. It has very specific goals. Stop the three major forms of violations, and we'll stop the boycott. It's very simple. So what are the three violations? They correspond to the three sectors in which the Palestinian people have been divided. So one is we want freedom from occupation for Palestinians living in the 67 territories. We want equality for Palestinian citizens of Israel who are now treated as second or third or fourth class citizens. And we want a legal, just solution to the refugee problem for the five million plus Palestinian refugees on the basis of international law and Resolution 194 at the United Nations. When Israel stops those violations and starts allowing those 
rights guaranteed by international law, the boycott ends, the divestment campaigns end, the sanctions end. Globally, BDS has transformed people's understanding of what Israel is all about. Israel is no longer seen around the world as plucky little David fighting back against these Arab armies that have surrounded it. It's now understood as a repressive government that is itself repressing people within its own borders and in the countries that it occupies in territory that is not theirs. And this, I should mention, has nothing to do with how many states ultimately win out. One state, two state, red state, blue state. I used to be part of these debates all the time. Should we be one state or should we be two states? And finally, a bunch of us about 15 years ago started realizing, you know what? It's not our call. Except for those who are Palestinians who happen to be here. Or those, frankly, who are Israelis who happen to be here. It's not the call of a bunch of people in the United States to decide how many states should there be across the world. What we should be demanding is international law and equality for all. Human rights. If there's one state, equality for all within that one state. One person, one vote. Everybody's equal. No privileging of somebody because you're Palestinian. No privileging of somebody because you're Jewish. No oppressing somebody because you're not Jewish. If there's two states, you need two kinds of equality. You need equality within both states and between both states. Nobody's talking about that. If we have two states, one could imagine there could have been two states. My own view is it's kind of too late. That ship has sailed. I don't think it's possible anymore, but that's just my judgment. I'm a Jewish girl from California. What do I know? So that's not our job. Our job is to fight for a US policy that demands international law, human rights, and equality for all over and over and over again. That means not privileging anybody, not discriminating against anybody, and not being willing to accept our supposed allies claim that it and it alone represents democracy, justice, and all things righteous in the world. So that's what BDS has made possible. In the, U in the US, we haven't yet had the kinds of BDS successes that they've had, for example, in Europe. In Europe, it's been amazing. The biggest single uh, contract that had to be canceled in a European context happened about three years ago when the city of Stockholm had to cancel a $10 billion contract with the Veolia Corporation. It's a French corporation that's one of these giant global corporations that kind of does everything. They, they own a bunch of the airport shuttle lines around the US. They do water stuff. They do uh, light rail systems. They had a contract with Israel to build a $10 billion light rail system linking Jerusalem with the occupied West Bank. And there was so much pressure against the Stockholm City Council that Veolia's contract was canceled and they said explicitly because of concerns about human rights. Wow, that was amazing. Now we have not had a victory on that level yet. We've had small victories, but they're important. What it has done has been to transform people's understanding of what relations with Israel are actually all about, what we're supporting when we buy Israeli goods or when we have our companies profiting from Israeli occupation. Caterpillar bulldozers, a, 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 you know, one of the iconic companies in the United States for farmers and for communities that want to buy a bulldozer to deal with cold winters, whatever, you know. What are they making a profit from? The D9 bulldozer made in Peoria, Illinois, is specially made to Israeli specifications, Israeli military specifications, so that they can be armored and made into weapons of war. It was a D9 bulldozer driven by an Israeli soldier that killed Rachel Corey. That's what Caterpillar is making a profit from. They're making a killing, in every sense of the word, on these goods. That's even before we get to the question of the intersection of military supplies and the military collaboration between the Pentagon and the IDF and between companies in this country that build the bombers and the bombs and the drones and the companies in Israel that build their drones and bombers and bombs and the tanks and how they all collaborate with each other to make a killing globally. 
as well as the collaboration on the local level. I don't know about Des Moines, but there are cities across this country who are sending their police forces to be trained by Israeli soldiers. The ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, which likes to position itself as one of the great civil rights organizations of our country, is behind this campaign. And it's designed to build the collaboration so that US police forces that are supposed to represent us and defend our rights, keeping us safe in our communities, instead are being trained to, to think of the people they are protecting as an occupied population who have to be kept down, the way the Israeli military keeps down the Palestinians. So you combine that with the US military campaigns to send leftover military equipment to cities around the world, and you have Ferguson. Why was there an armored personnel carrier trapped in the streets of Ferguson when Mike Brown was killed? Why was the police force of Ferguson trained by Israeli soldiers? And what did that have to do with what the police did that night, those nights? when the people of Ferguson rose up to say no more to the killing of young black people in their community. So this is a very American issue, the relationship with Israel. Now the good news is there's been an incredible shift in the discourse on this question. There has not been a shift in policy for 50 years, but there has been a huge shift in the public discourse, a significant shift in the media discourse. The media is still very problematic. But it is so much better than it was five years ago or 15 years ago that it's, it's almost incomprehensible for those of us who have been monitoring it all along. It's staggering to see how much better it is. It's not because somebody got enlightened. It's because there have been organizations like Sabil, like the Friends of Sabil North America, like Jewish Voice for Peace, like the US campaign for Palestinian rights, what some of you may remember as the US campaign to end Israeli occupation, has a new name. All these organizations around the country have been working to change how the media covers it. The great organization IMEU, the Institute for Middle East Understanding, whose sole job is to get Palestinian voices into the US media and voices for justice for Palestine into the US media, they started as the idea in somebody's head with two people working incredibly hard. They now have a staff of, I think, 20 all over the country with incredible successes, getting pieces into every major newspaper, every middle-sized newspaper, every TV station in the country. It's been amazing. It doesn't mean it's done. There's a ton of work to do. But what has been achieved so far because of that work has been just an amazing thing to watch. And on the public level, even more so, at the public level, if you look at the polls, it's incredible. Now, some of that is because the issue of support for Israel has become a far more partisan issue than it ever was before. To the degree that it was partisan at all, it was a kind of liberal democratic issue for a really long time. That hasn't been true for a long time. What's true these days is it's a kind of right-wing Republican issue more than anything else. That's where you find the majority of support for Israel in the most active sense. The most influential parts of the Israel lobby in that context is the Christian Zionist lobbies, Kufi and company. Those are where you're seeing influence on the Republican Party, et cetera. That's not to say that AIPAC has no influence. One of the other shifts that's underway in public discourse is within the Jewish community, which Naim indicated is, is on the rise. JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace, the organization that I work with, has grown from a scrappy little Bay Area collective of you know, a couple of dozen people to an organization that now has a staff of 30 all over the country, a rabbinical council of, I think, 35 rabbis, an arts council, an academic council, 45 plus chapters, 40,000 paid members, 250,000 online supporters, it, it's been an amazing thing. And of course, we saw not too long ago when five people were kept out of Israel who were going on an IFPB delegation to Palestine and Israel. 
Five people were kept out. Three of them were activists from JVP, including a rabbi. So we gotta be doing something right, right? <laughs> um, you know, this is, it's an incredible moment. Part of the reason that the BDS campaign is under such pressure right now is precisely because APAC and the other parts of the Jewish component of the pro-Israel lobby are afraid they're losing their children. They're losing their youth. Young Jews are less and less and less committed to Israel, interested in Israel, view their Jewish identity as having anything to do with Israel, and instead are defining Jewish identity the way many of us grew up, defining Jewish identity in the context of social justice. And it's not the kind of social justice that we used to call PEP, progressive except Palestine. <laughs> because now, social justice means Palestine. Maybe we'll have to start calling it PWEP, progressive with Palestine. We'll need a better acronym. But this is what we're seeing all over the country. And that's why APAC is concentrating on the students, on campuses, on this new terrible bill that's pending, the anti-boycott bill, which the good news is it actually doesn't make BDS as it exists illegal. They seem to think it does, but they deliberately wrote language. And APAC drafted this thing. APAC drafted the language. And the language is very specific, that what it makes illegal is calling for a boycott of Israel at the request of an international multilateral organization, meaning a, an organization of nation states, like the United Nations or the European Union, which would be a concern if either the United Nations or the European Union was calling for BDS. So far, no, you know, not because we haven't been trying, but so far, they have not called for BDS. The call for BDS comes from civil society. It's not a multilateral organization. There's no governments in there. So supporting BDS is not in violation even if this law passes. Can somebody please turn off your phone? Everybody else use the moment, turn off your phone. It's really distracting up here. They are really trying to intimidate people into thinking that this makes BDS illegal. Guess what, it doesn't. But on the other hand, it's a terrible law because it is aimed at intimidating free speech. The, the Supreme Court of our country has said explicitly that boycotts are a legal form of constitutionally protected free speech, period, full stop. This is not gonna pass muster even with this Supreme Court, I think. I think, but really, it shouldn't. So that's important, but it's also important to recognize that it's emerging because we are winning. We are winning hearts and minds, if you will. The rise of organizations like Open Hillel. You know, Hillel is supposed to be the organization of all Jewish students, right? All opinions are welcome here. It's a big tent, but we have a red line. The red line is BDS. No one from Hillel is to have a discussion or a debate about BDS in a Hillel building. And a number of young American Jewish kids who were joining Hillel said, wait a minute, we might be Jewish, we're interested in Jewish identity, but we are still Americans. We still have something called the First Amendment. We still have the right of free speech. We still have the Constitution. You can't tell us what to talk about. And the grown-ups in Hillel said, well, as a matter of fact, young man, young woman, yes, we can. And they tried. And so the kids said, bye-bye. And they formed this organization called Open Hillel. It was amazing. I was at their founding conference at Harvard a couple of years ago. There were 400 young students there, so energized and so informed and so committed. It was, and you know, they had all kinds of opinions. They didn't all support BDS. Some of them didn't even want to talk about BDS. But they certainly didn't want somebody else telling them that they couldn't. So it was like the best of what our Constitution should be doing in training our young people. It was quite amazing and quite fabulous. But we also have to keep in mind that that discourse shift, as important as it is, has not yet translated into a policy shift. The democracy in our country, as we all know, is so flawed, so broken, that public opinion plays only a small part in determining what our policies actually are. It is, however, 
a necessary but insufficient part of what it takes for policy change. Changing discourse isn't enough, but you can't change policy without changing the discourse. Because at the end of the day, what people in Congress care about more than anything else is getting reelected. That's why they want money. That's why they want these lobbies in their pocket. It's to get them votes so they can be reelected. That's what it's all about. So the discourse work is really crucial. Ironically, we are starting to see the beginnings of some moves towards what will become a policy shift. So if we look at the, at the polls, in 2010, that was a fascinating year. Obama has been in office for about a year. He's all of a sudden taking on Israel-Palestine in a more assertive way. That's the summer Netanyahu comes to Washington to lecture this upstart young president. And you remember what happened. He's, they're sitting there, president and prime minister, and Netanyahu starts lecturing Obama with his finger out. He's shaking his finger, treating him like an errant schoolboy. And Obama is holding on. He's holding, he's not responding. He's, he's drumming his fingers on the, on the chair. It was an extraordinary thing to watch. You can see him holding tight to wanting to get up and smack this racist dog across the face. It was really, like that. I, I, that was what I was thinking, and I'm assuming, I can only assume President Obama had a similar, it, the, the racism of it was so profound. It was that summer, but at the same time that summer, the press, to a large degree, is talking about how Obama is throwing Israel under the bus. Obama is abandoning Israel. Remember hearing that? Now, in fact, there was no bus. Nobody was throwing anybody anywhere. But the language was changing. Suddenly, you did not have a president who was being obsequious to the Israeli leadership. Yes, we don't like Israeli settlements, but could you just pull back just a little bit? We didn't have that. We had somebody saying, settlements are wrong, period, full stop. It was a whole different world rhetorically. Again, there was not even a hint that the $10 billion a year that we were giving directly to the Israeli military was going to change. So no, nobody was throwing anybody under a bus. But it was a powerful enough moment that an awful lot of people, I think, across this country did think that President Obama was doing something that was maybe not going to be so powerful and so popular with Israeli leaders. And that was the moment that the Zogby operation, Democratic Party pollsters, did a poll on US policy in the region. And one of the questions they asked was about settlements. And the question said something like this. Israelis are building settlements across the West Bank. Which of the two sentences to follow best describes how you think about that? Sentence number one said, Israelis are building settlements for security reasons and they have the right to build wherever they want. Statement number two, said Israelis are building settlements on, I'm forgetting the term, on expropriated land that should be torn down and returned to its original owners. Now, according to international law, that second statement is pretty accurate in describing Israeli settlements. But it's a pretty provocative way of describing it, deliberately so. Provocative or not, that same summer that Obama is being accused of throwing Israel under the bus, 64% of Democrats chose sentence number two. That was astonishing. Nothing like that had ever been seen before. Now granted, it's a poll. It's a snapshot. It's a moment in time. But it was at that particular moment which made it significant, right? And of course, I've been talking about it for the last seven years, so whatever. So it has historical weight, right? But it is important that there was this change underway. There was this real change. We saw it in 2015 when 60 members of Congress skipped the speech of Benjamin Netanyahu who came to Congress, took over the, the Capitol building as if it was his own, started introducing people in the, you know, the way presidents do at the State of the Union. It was unbelievable. 60 members of Congress said, I'm not going to put up with this. Now granted, only some of them had that position because of Israeli treatment of Palestinians. For many others, I think the majority of others, they were from the Congressional Black Caucus, known as the Conscience of the Caucus, uh, the Con 
conscience of the Congress, who said, Netanyahu has treated our president with incredible racism, and we are not going to sit there and treat him as somebody we should take seriously. But whatever the, the rationale, whatever the specifics of the motivation, the fact that 60 members of Congress were prepared to refuse to attend was unprecedented. And the other thing about it that was so important was nothing happened. The sky didn't fall. Nobody lost their position. APAC, you know, fluttered their whatevers, but they couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't get anybody diselected because of that. That was absolutely huge. You saw it in 2016 in the run-up in the Democratic Party platform debate where you had people like Jim Zogby and Cornell West and others in the platform committee because Bernie Sanders had been a serious candidate and appointed them to the platform committee. You had a real debate about Palestinian rights. Now at the end of the day, again, we're not there yet. The, the final platform was as bad or in some ways worse than the 2012 one. But you had on national television a debate over what a Democratic Party platform for justice should look like. That in itself was a shift in the political discourse. And of course you had Bernie Sanders refusing to go to APAC, refusing to toe the line, going instead to, uh, to Utah and giving a foreign policy speech, as he put it, the one I would have given to, to APAC, but that was specifically about Palestinian rights and the need to change US policy. That was unprecedented as well. So all of this is underway. We are at a moment when the issue of Palestinian rights is being mainstreamed across this country. And our job as activists, church activists, secular activists, is to take advantage of that moment. Take advantage of this mainstreaming of the issue that has never existed before. So organizations that we never thought would be possible are interested in this issue. The, 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 the past president of the National Organization for Women, who turns out to be a huge supporter of Palestinian rights, who knew? She's trying to arrange a set of teach-ins around the country for now chapters. What an amazing idea. We never thought as Palestinian activists, Palestinian rights activists, we always felt like we were kind of on the, on the margins. We were sort of out in the, you know, in the boondocks and we weren't really welcome in the, at the grown-ups table. Well, suddenly we are at the center of the table and we need to take advantage of that. We can't just assume that things will get better because the discourse is changing. We need to keep working on the discourse. We need to keep working on the, on the media. Letters to the editor, op-eds, challenging them when they get stuff wrong because they still get stuff wrong all the time. That has to go on. We can't stop doing that. But we do it now from a position of strength, the likes of which we've never had before. The fact that major Christian denominations, and my friend Naeem didn't even applaud this sufficiently, so here we are. The Methodists, the Presbyterians, the UCC, the, the Mennonites, the, well, the traditional peace churches, the Mennonites, the, the, the Quakes, you know, but, but the non-traditional peace churches, like the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the UCC, are taking these incredible positions calling for boycotts, calling for something that looks like divestment from Israeli occupation. Some are using the language of apartheid. They're all using the language of equality and international law and human rights. That this is not just about religion, this is not just about protecting Christians, this is about rights. This is about equality. This is about our world. And that's what makes this such an extraordinary mo moment. So I think, just to finish, and then we'll have time for, for questions, we have to build on these new realities that we're facing. The reality that the issue of Palestinian rights is not some tricky thing that you have to navigate before you can say it. We have to have police scattered around in case there's like a, a riot that erupts. This is part of the discourse of our country because this issue is an American issue. We are enabling, as a country, Israeli occupation and Israeli apartheid. 
The $10 billion a year that we give in our tax money, and then we say we don't have enough money for jobs and health care and education in our own country. There's something wrong with that because it's not going to provide health care and jobs and education for kids in Israel. It's going directly to the military. So we need to be asking, are you, Israel, using that $10 billion to pay for your juvenile military justice system? Prove it to us that you're not. Prove it to us. There has not been any such proof. So we are part of a global movement, the global BDS movement. We are part of it. We are also the ones, because we live in the country that is more than any other country responsible for the oppression of Palestinians, we are responsible for some other stuff, challenging the military aid to Israel, challenging how the US protects Israel in the United Nations, supporting the role of the United Nations while challenging the US effort to make the UN into a tool of US foreign policy. We have a lot of work ahead. But what's amazing is we're doing it at a moment where we are more powerful than ever. Congratulations to all of you for making it possible. Thank you. And, oh, right. so, thank you. So we do have, is this the only mic? Oops. All right, we have just a few minutes here, and then uh, we'll, lunch has just arrived, so we'll take a few minutes to get it set up. But in the back, there's a question. Uh, Phyllis, do you want to no, mention no. the three million bucks it, it, that goes to uh, Egypt? Uh, no, I, I didn't mention a lot of things, but <laughs> I, I didn't mention there's three. I, I'm not going to do it without the mic because it won't be on the film. Okay, I. Um, it's nice to hear that we're p more powerful than ever. We feel somewhat sheepish, I think, with, with the current administration. And uh, what do you, uh, what do you, how do you react to the growing anti-Semitism on the right? I mean, it's, a, it, in a way, it's a chink in the Zionist wall, but it's also very disturbing and it seems to be coming out and being much more open. Uh, and if that, I think, complicates everything. Mm -hmm. You're going to get your exercise running back and forth here. This is good. Yeah, I mean, of course, I'm very concerned about the rise in anti-Semitism. Um, I see it very much in the context of the rise in racism, which is at a far more virulent, <coughs> violent level than the anti-Semitic component of it, but it's certainly part of that, and of course it's very concerning. I do think we should be careful not to make assumptions about how that makes everything more complicated. That takes us in a certain way back to an earlier period where we all, that's the problem, we all worried uh, in many ways too much about how do I do this work and not be accused of anti-Semitism? Well, the easy way to not be accused of anti-Semitism is don't be an anti-Semite. Call it out when you see it, because it does exist. It exists at times in our movement, and it exists massively on the right, from whether it's the Nazis, the Klan, racism and anti-Semitism always went together. So that's what we do about it. But to think that somehow the fact that right-wing bigots are linking anti-Semitism to their racism somehow makes it more difficult or that we should be more cautious in defending Palestinian rights, I think is absolutely the wrong approach. It's quite the opposite. We fight for equality for all. We fight against racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism together. Because they emerge together, we fight them together. This week I went to a panel discussion at the University of Nebraska in Omaha, uh, a panel on Middle East allegedly telling us we would know all the right answers. And when Sharon and I gave questions about the extra set of laws for Palestinians and the Israeli citizens, we were told by that panel we were wrong. Yes. You're not wrong. So how do yeah. we fight a public institution whose uh, 
educational department is supported by the Jewish expenditures. The, set, the, the group that teaches that department is a Jewish funded department. I'm not sure what you mean by a Jewish funded department. I think you're probably meaning a pro Israel. The Schwab, yeah, the Schwab Center at the University of Nebraska is studying for Jewish studies. Oh, the Center for Jewish Studies. Okay, that doesn't tell me anything about where it's funded. It may be a pro Israel operation, it may not be. But, okay, but I'm just saying that's the kind of language that's not helpful, saying it's a Jewish funded something. I don't know who funds it, and it's not clear you know who funds it. So, okay, well, who? Okay. I don't know the specific name, but you do know that it's funded by Jewish organizations that are pro Israel. Okay, but the pro Israel part is the relevant part. So that's, the that's what I'm saying. That, well, if that's the case, okay. if it, it may be, you know, a Jewish funded, it may be Jewish Voice for Peace who funds it. Sounds like probably not. <laughs> but, but you get my point. Yeah. I think the way we challenge all of that is by facts, challenging facts. The law, there are over 50 laws in Israel, we're talking inside Israel, not in the occupied territories, that call for different rights to be accorded to Jews and non-Jews. They're not, the language does not say that they are specific laws for Palestinians. They're defined as rights that are available to Jews and not to non-Jews, which means Jews and Palestinians, in fact, but they don't call it that. So there is an organization, for example, called Adala that works inside Israel, whose job it is to monitor uh, the legal discrimination against Palestinian citizens of Israel. You can get from their website a listing of those laws, present it, you know, and have it with you when you raise a question like that in a public way, and, and you say, I have here a copy of five of those 50 laws. I printed them out. I'm glad to make them available to everybody on, you know, sort of embarrass them with it. Um, often in those situations, the people that are actually on the panel, chances are they don't even know those laws exist. If they did, they would probably think they were fine, but they probably don't even know because that's not something that pro-Israel curricula teach you. They don't mention that, you know, they, they just don't talk about it. So chances are they don't actually know about it. So their instinct is to say, oh, that doesn't exist. Because I'm an expert on Israel and I don't know about it. So therefore it doesn't exist. It's a nice little tautology. So Can I think you spell that group for us? A D A L A H, just like it sounds. Adala. And I think Naeem, do you remember is it Adala.org? Is that their website? Something like that. Yeah. But if you if you Google law, you know, just put in laws. Uh, separating Israeli and Palestinian rights or something like that, you'll, you'll get it. But, I mean, that's just an example. There's, and you were giving one example. There's always questions that come up that are simple. People just lie. Right now, in this country, people lie with impunity because the president has sort of said it's okay. <laughs> so we have an even bigger challenge ahead. But I think the other part of it is to always remember that there's this combination of propaganda goals and ignorance. And our job is to get the actual information in there so that they can't rely on the ignorance, so that the propaganda goals become clearer. I'll give you one quick example. There's an organization called the David Project that, uh, oh no, actually I take it back. It's not the David Project that does this one. It's, it's the Israel Project, which is a different one. It's one of the many pro-Israel lobbying organizations. And they specialize in building pro-Israel organizations and mobilization on college campuses. And every year they publish a, um, a guide, it's like a booklet, they publish it now online, um, that's a guide for pro-Israel activists on campus. And it has lots of good ideas about how to do events and how to reach people and all those things. It's, you know, it's a, an activist guide, the, the usual thing. What they started doing several years ago was changing the tone of it to reflect the fact that more and more young Jewish students were not pro-Israel to start with. That they now had to win them over rather than just mobilizing what everybody already was. And in the most, well it wasn't the most recent one, the last one that I saw was about two years ago. It, when I was looking at it, I thought, God, this one seems so much longer than it used to be. And I realized they had added this new introduction that was like 20 pages long. It went on and on. 
And reading it, I felt like, wait a minute, did I write this? You know, it, it felt like it was this listing of everything Israel does wrong. Not everything, but a lot of things that Israel does wrong. And, it's, and the frame was a lot of Jewish students are increasingly concerned about how Israel is building more settlements. Some think that there is a violation of international law. Some people think that there is discrimination. They're going on and on with this stuff. And I'm like, where is this going? And then what I realized is they were being very, very strategic. And what they said was, we need to make clear that criticism of Israel is perfectly acceptable. But, but, those who would delegitimize Israel must be excluded. That's where you draw the red line. So they're, they're recognizing that they can't make the assumptions they once did, that, but that there are red lines. You know, they're just drawn in a slightly different place. And that if you're strategic and you want to win people over, you have to start where they are. This is what every good organizer knows. You don't start with where you want people to be. You start with where they are and push them to where you want them to be. So if you start where people are, people are increasingly critical of Israel. So that's where you start. And we're at a, at a real advantage for this because we have the facts on our side. And just to put in a slight little plug, because my father was a salesman, he knew how to do this. My book is done as frequently asked questions. So some of that, will, it's, it can be useful for that kind of stuff, just to look up you know, how, to, how do you answer X, that kind of thing. Well, I'm sorry. Jeez. That will make you deaf. Um, or wish you were. I have time for just one more question, oh. and then Phyllis is going to be here, so if you have something you really need to ask her, feel free. But I promised Patty the microphone, so. I was really interested in the part where you were talking about U.S. or U.S. Um, police forces being trained in Israel, um, and something related to that is security forces or security companies. I guess you would call them surveillance companies. Um, I was protesting against the Bakken pipeline or the Dakota Access pipeline that came through Iowa, and I was um, we did that protest here and in North Dakota. And one of the surveillance groups was G4S, which I understand is in Israel, and um, the surveillance against Palestinians. Um, I was wondering, do you know of other connections between Israel and the US in, in that category? Mm. Very good question. Mm. I'm staying away from that speaker. <laughs> First, thank you for being part of the, the protest against the pipeline. It's been so critical. And it, again, you all know that there was a, a Palestinian contingent that went to Standing Rock, uh, making the connection between the rights of indigenous people in this country and the rights of indigenous people in Palestine. So it's been a really important, powerful connection. Uh, one of the native leaders, a very close friend of mine, who's the head of the Native Organizers Alliance, comes out of the Palestine Solidarity Movement and has spent time both in Lebanon and in Palestine, and, it's, and she brings that to her work with other Native communities, so it's a wonderful thing. There are a number of companies. Israel has become known globally. It's, it's the single biggest uh, component of their economy after diamonds, uh, processing diamonds, not mining diamonds, is this um, export of security and surveillance companies. That's what they're, they're really starting to specialize in. And they are moving aggressively all over the world, Africa in particular, but also Latin America, Europe, other places, to sell this stuff. I don't have in my head a lot of the other companies, but there's a number of, of organizations, websites. One is the US Campaign, which is uh, uscampaign.org, uh, has a section that deals with um, some of the current targets for the BDS campaign. Another is an Israeli website called uh, Who Profits. I think it's whoprofits.org. That's an Israeli women's peace group that have, they've done probably the most comprehensive listing of all of the um, uh, corporations, international but particularly US corporations, that are operating in and profiting from the occupied territories. So you can find some of them there. They're divided by type and all that. It's, it's a very useful resource. So there's a lot. 
G4S is one of the, the targets right now because it's one of the biggest and it's working in a whole bunch of countries. Um, so it's very key in uh, the US surveillance process. They've been negotiating for a position to help build Trump's wall on the border. So there's a lot of connections there and it's a really important link. Thank you so much. Bill. You're welcome. Right. What are you hiding for? What are you hiding for over here? <laughs> <laughs> Just one thing here, Lewis has a quick yeah. announcement.